But it's the middle of the night here, over here, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to be with you. It really is. And uh, uh, I always enjoy these early morning things. Uh, I've got another one coming up at um, 11 o'clock. I've got to be in the city nearby here. Uh, so uh, it's going to make an interesting morning. But I always enjoy being there. I want to speak this morning for a few moments on on the appearance, the appearance of Christ, the appearance of Christ, so what? The appearance of Christ, so what? Uh, in 1976, Colorado uh, saw one of the most powerful floods the state had ever known. Uh, it was estimated that 12 inches of rain fell uh, over a course of about four, four hours, and that's what they usually get in a year. And so uh, the, the, the amount of rain was tremendous. And as you can guess, it caused a lot of catastrophe and so forth and so on. But it was right near the big Thompson Canyon. And uh, it was a beautiful sunny day uh, down in the canyon. And uh, there were people camping up on the hills and down in the canyon and so forth and so on. And the police, were going up and down, telling people, get out, get out, you have to get out. The, there's water coming. And uh, years later, Carol and I were, we, we drove down that canyon and there were signs. There were uh, various places, there were signs saying, in case of rain, get out. In case of rain, get out. Well, people looked up at the sky and they listened to the police and uh, they basically said, well, I don't see any rain. I don't see any, I don't see anything like that. So they stayed there, many of them. And in the end, 144 people would be dead, including one Colorado State policeman, um, a name, man named Willis Purdy. Now, years later, Carol and I drove down that canyon and it's kind of a scary place because you get into the canyon and you realize that if you were in there and there's a lot of water coming down, you stand no chance. In fact, the water came out and uh, uh, it went six miles out into the plains. That's how much water there was. It's just an amazing thing. We stopped at one case and tried to ask people well uh, about it, but they didn't want to talk about it. It was still too raw, I suppose. Now, the, the tragedy that caused the loss of at least some of these lives, and particularly that of the police officer, was that folk just wouldn't listen. They were, they were told clearly by an authority and, uh, and they just wouldn't listen. They looked up into the sky and they figured, no, I don't see any rain, I don't see any water. And 144 people lost their lives. Five would be missing and 250 more would be injured. And the point of telling this little story is that, that despite having a great authority, being told it's, there's a tragedy coming, they just would not listen. And uh, I think that's the problem a lot of these, these days, that we don't listen. And uh, listening means that we put it into action. It has to mean something. And I want to speak about the, the appearance of Christ this morning because that means something to us. If we're Christians, if we've trusted Jesus Christ as our own personal savior, wherever we are, whoever we are, uh, the, the, the fact is that one day, the appearance of Jesus Christ is gonna make a huge difference. One of the most precious facts of Christianity is that our God and our savior, our, our Lord is actually coming back. Now, just a a little technical point here. Christians love to argue about when. Um, is he coming back before the millennium, halfway through? Uh, at the end, is there even a millennium? Is he coming before the tribulation, halfway through or when? And so it goes on. Uh, Ronald Luland, who was the minister in Bedford, who married us and baptized me and stuff like that, uh, he, uh, he told me one time, he believed that uh, he believed in pan millennialism. In other words, it's all going to pan out in the end. So, okay. But uh, just a couple of real facts that we do know, uh, regardless of the time. 
uh, first of all, we know that he's going to come back for his bride and he'll come back alone. He'll come to claim his bride and the bride, of course, is the church consisting of all believers, all who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal savior. He is going to come back. He'll come alone and uh, uh, he'll be joined by his bride in the air. Now, we know this that the, the next time he comes will be uh, to rule and reign for a thousand years. And that will be, of course, at the end of the, of the seven years tribulation. But this time he'll come with his bride, not for his bride, but with his bride. We shall come with him. If you want to read the details of that, look at Revelation chapter 19. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine Linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses, They say it says there, so we'll be amongst them. Now, just a quick point here. Uh, it, there is no other God or leader of, religion, of any religion who can possibly say this, only Jesus Christ. There's all kinds of religion, people, Mohammed, Confucius, Buddha, all of those, and a host of other ideas. Go to India and... Uh, and there's literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of gods. But there's only one who's alive. There's only one who is able to save us, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he's the only one who could possibly do this. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter two, to 9, we, we'll get to the other text in, in a while. But Hebrews chapter 9, if you don't have one there, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll read them. It, it makes three statements in that one chapter. In chapter 9, verse 26, it says this, that Christ has appeared. He has appeared. Uh, once at the end of the ages, Christ has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, Christmas is coming, and I love Christmas, and all to do with that. Uh, but at Christmas time... Uh, despite the fact it's obviously not in the bleak midwinter, uh, but uh, despite that, he uh, uh, <clears throat> he has come. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 tells us clearly why he came. He came to put away sin. His express purpose was to come to this earth and to die on Calvary's cross. Some years ago, I produced a, a tract which some of you may have may have seen. Uh, I, it's called the crib and the cross. And as you'll see, there's a picture of the nativity scene, and there's a there's a cross laying over it, and it ties in John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That's Christmas. And then whoever believes on Him shall not perish. That's Easter. If we trust Him and we believe Him, that's that's it, that that speaks about Easter. So. He has appeared once to put away sin. Now, the, the big question, of course, this morning is, is have, have you and I, have we actually trusted Christ as our own personal savior? Have we allowed him to put away sin for us? He's already paid for the sins of the whole world. Everybody's sin, past, present, and future in this world has been paid for by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The question is, have we actually trusted him? So we read in 926 of Hebrews that he has put away his sin. But now, if you look at verse 24 of that same chapter, you'll find not only has he appeared, but he now appears. Verse 24 says this, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are a picture or the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, the wonderful thing is this, that, uh, uh, that, that Christ now is in the very presence of his Father, and he appears for you and me as believers, uh, not in a condemned way, but, to, but, but he discusses with his Father the things to do with us. He cares about us. The, the God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son are all in agreement as to us. And so we're told in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he is our advocate. 
in heaven. He is face to face with, that's what that word with there means. He's face to face with Christ, uh, sorry, with, with God, our father. And uh, that's an awesome thought. So he has appeared to put away our sin. And if we've trusted him as our own personal savior, he's put away our sin. But he now appears in heaven for us. At this, <clears throat> at this very moment, he is appearing with his father for you and for me. And because of the, 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 the almighty God that he is, he is able to advocate or be our advocate for, uh, for every single one of us in every detail of our life. He knows about you. He cares about you individually. That's the kind of God we have. Now, also, it goes on in that same chapter in verse 28 to say that he shall appear. So he has appeared. He does appear. And he shall appear. Jesus Christ is coming back. And I believe that that very, very soon, I don't know dates, I'm not up to that, but I, I do believe he's coming back very, very soon. Uh, but it, it says in verse 28, it says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Why without sin? Because he dealt with that already. He's dealt with it and done with it. Now, all it means for us is that, that if we, we need to trust him as our own personal savior, and we'll be done with it too. Not that we won't have any problems, but when we leave this life, this old earthly body, it'll all be done. So he has appeared. He now appeared and he shall appear. But there's another verse in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 says this. Uh, he says, it tells us that he will not only will he appear, but he will bring rewards. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, Paul says. And not to me only, but unto all them who love his appearing. Now, here's, a, here's an amazing situation, amazing fact of grace is that not only did he die for us, not only does he represent us in heaven, if you were saved two minutes ago, that means you. If you were saved 50 years ago, that means you. Not only has he appeared, not only does he appear, but he is coming back, and he's coming back for you and for me, for his bride. And I love that. I love that thought. But more than that, incredible grace. We who were completely lost sinners, enemies of his, he's actually going to bring rewards. I mean, you think, well, well, well we, didn't, we didn't and couldn't do anything for salvation. We certainly didn't deserve any rewards, but that's what it says. And then it goes on even further in 1 John <clears throat> chapter 3 and verse 2. And it says this, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, that's, that's an in incredible, incredible thought that not only has he appeared, not only does he appear, not only shall he appear, not only will he bring rewards with us, but we shall be like him. What does that actually mean? I think sometimes we think it means that, that we're going to be like wisps of smoke or something like that, or spirit, I don't know. <clears throat> but I'll tell you this. According to what I read in the Word of God, uh, the only thing that will be missing is this old sinful flesh the thing that's caused us all the problems and so forth and so on. <clears throat> because we, we, are, we are going to uh, receive a, a glorified body, a new body. Now, sometimes people say, well, we, we recognize one another. Well, of course, uh, and I think that's an, an, an awesome, but well, how do you know? Well, I don't know. I just kind of look at indications from the scriptures. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, there's the Lord Moses and Elijah. Somebody recognized Moses and Elijah. I don't know how they did that, but they were recognizable individuals. There were three there, and they were recognizable. 
And then one day Peter got mad and he said, oh, I'm going fishing. And they all went fishing and they fished all night and caught nothing, which is what happens when we get in a bad mood and stuff like that. We don't actually achieve very much. So they're out there fishing. And all of a sudden they saw somebody on the shore cooking breakfast. John said, it's the Lord. Well, how did he know it was the Lord? Because he saw him, because he recognized him and so forth and so on. Anyway, that's another subject that you can you can debate and argue about what you want. Anyway, uh, I, I think that one day that we should be together and I think I'll still recognize you. So that's, that's what I think. Whether I'm right or not, I don't know. You theologians can argue that one out. But here we have an incredible... In, these are not uh, hopeful things. These are facts. This is what the Word of God says. Now, if that's true, if it's true that Christ has appeared, that he now appears, that he will appear, that he's going to bring rewards, and that one day, according to what I just read from the very word of God, that we're going to be like him, so what? So what? Does it make any difference? Or are we still picnicking in the canyon, waiting for the water to come down that we don't believe is going to come anyway? Are we just kind of carrying on in our life? We've heard about the Lord Jesus coming. And let's face it, let's face it, folks. You know, we don't we don't know the actual time, but but, but I mean I don't know about over there, but over over here, this world is in a mess like you wouldn't believe. We're actually on the verge of nuclear war, believe it or not. We have Kim Jong un, who thinks he's a god lobbing ballistic missiles that actually go over Japan. We've got Putin who wants to bring back uh, the old uh, USSR uh, and who knows what he's going to do. They have access to nuclear weapons. And more, more than that is there's just this, the complete, complete reversal of the things in the word. Book of Isaiah speaks of Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Well, I don't know about over there, but over here, that's just exactly how it is. The, the complete opposite. The things that we grew up with as a, as, a, as a kid that were absolutely sin and were absolutely wrong, and then nobody questioned it, nobody doubted it. Now they flaunt it on the streets. It's, it's, uh, uh, you're even attacked if you say it's wrong. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but I'm saying this. If, if, if the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, if we one day will be like him, and by the way, there's a, the, the, it, it does tell us in, uh, in, in 1 John, uh, it goes on from there uh, to say that we shall be like him, but it says this, and every man or every person who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. In other words, those that really believe that and those that have their, that hope in them purify themselves. Not that we can actually do it ourselves, but we look to the Lord to, to deal with those things which are error in our lives. So Colossians chapter 3, which is the text that I'm not sure if that was read because uh, I couldn't actually hear. But uh, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm going to read four, four verses here. It says this. If then you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What does it mean you're dead? Most of you over there, as I can see, look alive. I'm not sure about Albert the back there, but the rest of you, I can just see there's life there. And um, we say, what well, does it mean you're dead? It means that when you trusted Christ as your own personal savior, you were identified with Christ on Calvary's cross. You were literally, as it were, crucified with Christ, not actually on the cross. He did all that by himself alone, but he has identified us with him. And according to Romans chapter 6, we are dead, buried, and risen again to newness of life. But the question is, are we enjoying and living that, that new life? 
because it says in verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, and that means him living his life through us, shall appear, then you also shall appear with him in glory. I mean, these facts are absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, uh, when, uh, and, and some of us are a little, little older, but I'm 81 now. And I'll tell you what, I am so glad that, that uh, uh, by God's grace, I've walked with the Lord and served him for nearly 50 years full time and before that too. Uh, nothing else really matters. It, it doesn't matter how much money or land or that that we have. What matters is, as uh, is, is I think Jim Elliott said, um, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now, whoever we are, wherever we are, whatever our situation is, we can walk with the Lord and we should walk with him. So it says here in Colossians chapter 3, it says, if then you were, were, were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Now, in my King James Version, it says if. Now, the, there's no if in the sense that we use it these days. The actual, a, a, better, a better Greek translation would be, would be a better one to look at there. Uh, one Greek translator put it this way. He said, in view of the fact, in view of the fact, therefore, that you were raised with Christ, the things above be consistently seeking where Christ is on the right hand of God seated. Not if in the sense that we use it, but in view of the fact that you were crucified with Christ. You are in Christ. Your life is hidden with God in Christ. Yours, if you've trusted Christ as your own personal savior, that's how it is. So you were buried with him. So set your mind, verse two says, set your mind on things above. Verse one says, seek, seek and set. Uh, it says, set your, set your affection, but the actual better word is there, is mind, the things that we think about, the things that we're focused on. So we set our affection, we set our mind. These are the things that's important to us. I'm so glad this morning to see so many of you there in Randall Chapel. I think that's absolutely awesome. Where else would you be? What else is important? The things of the Lord are that which is important. So I would say, well, set your mind, the things that you're, that you're thinking of. Not on things of the earth. The, 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 the wealth, the honor, the pleasure, the sports. Uh, uh, I don't know about over there, but over here, they have uh, American football, which is played by uh, the Americans in, in well, in, in the, the United States. And uh, they have this thing called the Super Bowl, the World Championship. The fact that it's only played by Americans is a bit odd. But uh, people in Canada will close down the church on a Sunday evening just so they can watch an American football game played by two, two, two foreign teams. It's quite, it's quite amazing. People buy new phones over. I don't know what your phones are over there. Uh, but they buy new phones, cost thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars It's quite it's it's quite amazing. And they line up for hours to get these things. And these things are okay, but they're things that they're things that we should be setting our our minds on. I get quite amused about fashions. Now I'm I'm a long way away and you can't get to me, okay? So what I'm going to say now, I'm too far away. I'm protected from you uh, when I make a comment about fashion. Did you know that you can now go into a store and you can pay a lot of money for jeans that are already ripped with holes in them? Now, I don't know if you know if you have that over there. We have that over here. Great big gaping holes, the ones that we used to. We, if, if, if I wore clothes like that when I was over there, my mother would have been extremely upset. <laughs> so anyway, like I said, I'm protected. But it's amazing. Fashion. Somebody somewhere decides that the latest fashion should be jeans with holes in or long skirts, short skirts, so forth and so on. And all of these things, they're just the world's, the world's seeking to find some satisfaction. But what we as believers need to do and need to be, 
we need to seek those things which are above where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. And by the way, that's where you are seated too. That's actually your position in Christ. We live on this earth in a temporary way, but we are seated with Christ in, in the heavens, not on things on the earth. Why? Because Christ died for us and our life is hidden with Christ in God. They, people sometimes get into uh, discussions on eternal security. Well, am I eternally secure? Absolutely. Why? Well, because I didn't pay for my salvation in the first place. I didn't earn it and couldn't earn it. It was a free gift by grace, obtained by faith by grace. And so I'm saved that way. I could do nothing to maintain or to keep my salvation. That was already done. My life, according to this verse here, verse 3, my, according to this, I died in Christ, and my life is hidden with Christ in God. That's where yours is now. You know, it's, it's interesting because it, I don't know how long, how are, we, how are we doing? Albert, wave if I've gone over the time. He's not waving. He's waving. Oh, dear. Anyway, okay, nearly done. Nearly done. Okay. It, it talks about looking for his appearing. It talks about loving his appearing. But there's another verse that talks about being ashamed at his appearing. Well, why would be, how does that work? Why would be ashamed? I'll tell you what, folks. There'll be many believers who will, will realize at some point that Christ is coming. I'm not, they'll hear the trumpet or, what, or whatever. And instead of great joy, there'll be great shame. What a tragedy that is. They'll still be saved because we're not saved by what we do, but with what, what he did. So when Christ is our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. Verse 5 of Colossians chapter 3 says this, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. And he goes on to give a list of unfortunate things. Uh, but, but that's what we need to do. We need to walk with the Lord and allow him to live his life through us and be a blessing. I don't know if you actually uh, sung the hymn because I couldn't hear, but I, I requested that we sing a hymn and uh, I'm just going to close with this. I'm not going to sing it, but it, it, it says, marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful words of the King. Jesus is coming again, standing before him at last, trial and trouble all past, crowns at his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again in the chorus, coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon, coming again, coming in. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. And listen, my dear friends, he has come. He has appeared. He does appear, and he will appear. And one day, maybe very, very soon, we shall meet him in the air, and shall we shall forever be with the Lord. Meanwhile, been lovely being with you. Merry Christmas, and I shall catch up with you again soon. Let's close in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you so much for your word, for the confidence and the trust that we have in it. We thank you, Lord, that, uh, that we can believe implicitly every word that it says. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you did indeed appear. You did indeed come, and you did indeed die on Calvary's cross for our sin. As believers, Lord, we now thank you that you are appearing with the Father for us, Lord, all the time, daily, praying for us, as indeed we're told the Holy Spirit prays for us. We thank you for that, Lord. But, oh, Lord, we thank you that you will appear, that you are coming back again. And, Lord, we look forward to seeing you. We look forward to your appearing. We love your appearing. Lord, we pray that we may simply walk with you set our affections, seek those things which are above and not be ashamed that is coming. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this precious time together. In Jesus' name, amen.